Okay, so thank you very much for for taking some time to discuss the uh, particular subject of the Sisterhood of the Rose in Paris and Versailles. They are indeed uh, twin uh, twin sisterhoods. Uh, they work together and they have been for a very long time. So we will start by a history point, um, some, some reminders of the history of the sisterhood in the world, if that's okay with you. That's okay, sure. Thank you. So to start with some history, um, the French Revolution has created a collective trauma that is still present here in France and probably elsewhere. Is there a collective transmutation taking place now? Uh, what is happening is that uh, certain energetic conditions are very similar to the energetic conditions that were present uh, in the time of the French Revolution. So it's actually a repeat of the same story. Uh, it's an opportunity to go through that story in a, in a better way. Wonderful, and possibly do some healing, I suppose. Uh, yes, yes, definitely healing needs to happen, and this is one of the projects we're doing with uh, Sisterhoods of the Rose in France as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Many awakened people in France are feeling at the moment a resurgent memory of the French Revolution, especially since December 21st, 2001. Does this have a spiritual and energetic explanation? Uh, you're saying uh, since December 21st, uh, 2020. 20, I'm, for, I'm sorry, yes. yes, indeed, yeah. Yes, actually, uh, after the age of Aquarius activation, new energies were beginning to pour into the double Paris Versailles vortex, and those energies are beginning to give us the opportunity to clear uh, all those things that transpired to more than 200 years ago. And uh, those memories that are coming to the surface, especially for those who were present at that time, are an opportunity to um, heal that and to awaken to certain higher potentials that were active at that time that need to be reactivated and reconnected back again. Okay, okay. So, Naturally, the next question is, did the French Revolution cause any negative impact on a certain timeline? What happened is that the French Revolution is actually was a hijacking of a timeline, which was supposed to be going in a different direction. But at a certain point, uh, whatever happened was inevitable. It was a sum uh, of all the free will actions of people involved in that great uh, planetary drama. And at some point, it could not be reversed. So we are now in precisely the same situation. Whatever is happening since the start of the pandemic last year is something that became irreversible since 2019 as a result of uh, free will decisions of key players involved. And we're exactly in the same, in the same lesson. And now that we are in this new course, we're doing whatever we can to keep the positive Aquarius timeline going. And this is exactly uh, what was being planned already in the 18th century is a very old plan, which was quite active in France in the 18th century. Hmm. When you say irreversible, what do you mean exactly? It means that uh, there was a certain point in evolution of events in the uh, 18th century in France, especially in Paris, where uh, it was known that the French Revolution will happen, then there was no way to prevent it. And the same, this pandemic, or shall I rather say an attempt of society collapse became irreversible in the summer of 2019. So it's exactly the same dynamic that's happening now. Hmm. Okay, very clear. Thank you very much. We know that the name of Versailles is linked to the word verso. It comes from there, which means Aquarius in, uh, in English. And uh, the castle is built in a certain alignment with Washington and Jerusalem. Would Versailles and the place itself, the palace and the gardens, play a special role in the age of Aquarius? Uh, yes. Uh, what is happening is that Versailles is located on a very ancient uh, goddess uh, ley line, which was actually uh, equator in certain period of Atlantis. And this location was a vortex for tens of thousands of years. And this vortex was activated when the castle was built. And uh, this 
castle will be reactivated and certain locations very close to the castle will be reactivated after the event. There are certain plans, some of them are classified, some of them are public, that uh, will be reactivated uh, at the time of the event and after the event. Okay, wonderful. So you're answering the next question in parts, which is, uh, we wonder if Versailles, uh, the vortex in Versailles is a natural one or an artificial one created by the palace and the following initiations inside. What's the role of the Versailles Paris double vortex? Uh, so, as I said, this castle was built on the ley line and it, this position was used for initiations uh, which strengthened the vortex and connected it with Paris. So it actually, this link uh, between Paris and Versailles was strengthened by those initiations. Some of the initiations were happening in Paris itself and some of the initiations were happening at Versailles. So there was this connection strengthened and amplified through those initiations. And it created a, a figure eight energy flow which strengthened the goddess presence in the whole area. I see, yes, okay. Uh, could you tell us more, please, about the, the lodge founded by the Count of Saint-Germain, Saint-Germain in French, at that time, and why Paris was chosen in, in the significant year of 1775, year of the light, I, I suppose? Uh, this is uh, part of a big project uh, that was initiated uh, by Count of Saint-Germain already uh, in the 17th century called the New Atlantis. And it was planned for a certain group of souls to incarnate in France and especially in Paris since the beginning of the 18th century. And those souls uh, encountered each other and activated life codes. And uh, Saint Germain contacted some of those people, uh, especially in Paris. And most of those people were part of Masonic lodges, uh, positive uh, free Masonic lodges. And, uh, in uh, 1775, there was a big flash of energy coming from the galactic center, activating certain energy vortexes in the planetary uh, energy grid. And uh, some of those, uh, there were certain activations happening throughout 1775, most notably on March 21st, uh, 1775. And through those initiations, uh, a lot of light was grounded. And this was one of the projects of sub-projects of the New Atlantis project that was created by Count of Saint-Germain. Okay, wonderful. Um, it leads us to the question about priestesses, because the sisterhood is uh, obviously a feminine name and the Count of Saint-Germain being a man. We wonder um, the link, the connection with the priestesses and why have they activated the planetary Kundalini specifically in Notre Dame between November 8th and 11th, 2018? Uh, yes, Saint Germain uh, is a man and he was incarnated uh, in a male body because it was easier for him to do the work. Uh, he had more liberty of movement, more liberty of action. Uh, but I would say many of people that he initiated for women, uh, some of the leaders of uh, Masonic lodges that he uh, was involved with were women, and uh, many people in his inner circle, his, his inner uh, mystery school were also women. Uh, and uh, now, as there is this impulse to reactivate Paris Vortex, the resistance movement priestesses have come to the surface uh, in Paris, near Notre Dame, in 2018, and activated the Vortex, started Vortex reactivation again in uh, between November 8th and 11th, uh, 2018. And that was to implement more light in that in that place, or did it have to do with the timeline? Uh, it had many purposes. One of them was a reactivation of the Paris goddess vortex. The second one was reactivation of the planet of Recondolini, so that this situation with the French Revolution could heal. As you probably know, uh, Yellow West movement started uh, few weeks, one or two weeks after November 8th, uh, 2018. And it was a direct response to this Kundalini impulse. So uh, people are, again, beginning to fight for their freedom. And uh, this time, the light forces are trying to do whatever they can to direct this liberation fight in a way that will not be misused. Okay, great, perfect. 
Um, some alternative researchers and historians say that some sacred monuments in France were built in particular places in order to create particular geometries, such as the Merkaba. This is particularly the case in the Cathar country in the southwest of France. Could you explain the precise reason for this? Um, Cathars and Templars were connected to certain occult knowledge and uh, knowledge about Merkaba and the life body was part of that knowledge. And uh, many of Qatar and Templar monuments were positioned strategically uh, to reflect that. Uh, and this was like part of a sacred geometry project uh, to, I would say, reactivate the group or planetary uh, life body. This was the main reason for this behind the scenes. Okay. The planetary light body. Okay. Yes. It was deactivated, it was suffering. Can you can you repeat the question? The planetary light body, it needed to be reactivated because it was extinct extinct or suffering or or damaged? It was almost completely destroyed through all the wars, through all the invasions, through all the negativity that was present. Uh, since the fall of the Roman Empire in the 12th century, there was a lot of destruction in the area and uh, the ley lines were damaged and they need, it needed to be reactivated again. And uh, uh, Qatar and Templar projects were partially successful, I would say. They were more successful than it was expected. Wonderful. Okay, great. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, about the um, families in Europe um, and to talk a little about the Prussian timeline, is there any occult reason behind the the alliances, the marital alliances between some European families like the Habsburgs, the Bourbons, which would be linked to the Prussian timeline and a certain spiritual connection between France, Austria and Hungary? Okay, uh, Bourbon family and Habsburg family both are connected to the Grail bloodline. So this is the bloodline which uh, was transmitting uh, DNA of uh, a certain person that was named Jesus and a certain person that was named Mary, Mary Magdalene. And the uh, interconnection of those two bloodlines among other bloodlines was made on purpose by the white nobility to preserve the Grail uh, DNA and goddess mysteries. This was what was happening behind the scenes and uh, was not discussed publicly. Uh, but there were certain other bloodlines that wanted to prevent this from happening, and many of those incarnated in uh, the area of Russia, and this is why there were many military invasions or military incursions from Prussia into France throughout the last few centuries. Uh, again, there is also a connection uh, through, uh, through Bourbon and Habsburg families between France and Austria, and uh, also France and Hungary, because Habsburg uh, bloodline was ruling over Hungary as well through most of the time. Mm, okay. At this point, I would like to ask you if you would care to elaborate a little about what is a timeline exactly, as a geographical timeline um, is, um, for me, it's unclear if it's connected to people, to some sort of, to a, the DNA of people, or to sacred geometry in general? Uh, timeline is a vector of direction of the course of events. So a certain timeline has a tendency to push events in a certain direction. So that is a timeline. Okay, so we, when we connect it to Prussia or to Paris, to talk about a Parisian timeline, for instance, it's connected to the, um, the course of events connected to that place. Yes, with all the ideas, with all the uh, impulse with all the basic ideology of that place. Okay, great, thanks. You said that the region of Lorraine is a very important goddess, goddess vortex, which together with Untersberg and Venice goddess vortices holds the light of Europe. Can you please elaborate its occult, occult importance for France and for the whole world? Uh, also, uh, Lorraine uh, bloodline is one of the bloodlines that was connected to the Grail bloodline, and the whole region is uh, uh, also a very important goddess vortex. Okay. So, uh, I would say certain bloodlines uh, which were connected to the Grail bloodline tended to incarnate in uh, goddess vortex areas to 
anchor the energy of the goddess uh, through that feminine transmission from mother to daughter uh, through the bloodline. And this is the reason why that uh, bloodline was located in that area of the ring. Okay, okay, great. Um, Prussia um, occupied this region of Lorraine before World War I. Do I understand, according to what you're just saying, that they actually took this move in order to deactivate the vortex and then trigger the Great War? Exactly. This is exactly what happened, and this was one of the occult reasons that made World War I possible. Okay. Okay. Very clear. Thank you very much. Uh, you asked um, the white nobility members in Paris who are initiated to the mysteries and some Templars as well, to help for the Vortex activation. Can you explain why? Uh, it is because uh, certain members of white nobility uh, families were incarnated in the 18th century and uh, for the purpose of the Vortex activation at that time, and they have reincarnated again for the same purpose of reactivating the Vortex, uh, the Goddess Vortex in Paris. And it's time now for those people to gather and to the reactivation properly so that the goddess energy can enter through the vortex and help the planet. Uh, Paris vortex is now one of the key vortexes for the whole planet after the uh, Hungarian lingual vortex collapsed partially. So this is now a matter of planetary importance. Okay, because the Hungarian vortex and the Paris vortex were supporting each other. They were supporting each other and the Hungarian vortex is being reactivated to a certain degree, but now uh, the Paris vortex has top priority, and uh, <clears throat> I would call upon all those members of white nobility families who are part of this uh, goddess mysteries to come forward and assist in the reactivation of the Paris Vortex. Okay, whatever the initiation they feel they have received, if they feel a connection with the mystery of the goddess, then they, they might be interested in getting in touch, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, wonderful. Um, we would like to elaborate a little more on Mary Magdalene. She's been very present in, in France, and it's a very important part of our uh, connection here. Many women and men feel called by her teachings. And as you know, Mary Magdalene has left a trace of, of her presence here, and more specifically in the Qatar region in the south of France. Could you um, explain to us uh, if there is a particular reason for her stay here in France and tell us a little more about the Ross line and the Ley line from Paris to Chartres as well? Okay, um, when she was uh, traveling from Palestine, she landed with her boat uh, on the southern French coast, and this is where she established her uh, light, light centers, I would say, uh, where she was anchoring the light, when she was uh, establishing her bloodline and when, from where the bloodline has spread through the south of France first and, and then further on uh, throughout France and throughout Europe through the Grail bloodlines. And uh, now uh, she is actually an ascended being and she is working from higher energy planes with everybody who was involved with her teachings or with her work throughout the centuries. She's contacting those people spiritually and reactivating their memories, reactivating their awareness uh, with the purpose of the return of the goddess energy. As you probably know, Mary Magdalene was trained in the Isis temples in Egypt. She was an initiate. She was trained for many years in goddess mysteries. She was an advanced initiate and her work has just started uh, 2,000 years ago and uh, uh, continued since then. And she is working actually together with Goddess Isis as her senior disciple to return the Goddess Mysteries back to the planet. Mm. So that's that's the, that was my next question uh, to know about more a little more about her precise role in transmitting the mysteries of Isis and her divine union with Jesus and you say that she brought that uh, with her in her initiation and then in transmitting her bloodline. Yes, exactly, and she was also assisting Jesus with his own ascension process through divine union. This was part of the mysteries, actually assisting uh, somebody to ascend through. The sacrament of divine union is actually one of the higher aspects of mysteries of Isis. 
Right, physically and spiritually. Uh, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, on all levels of creation. Okay, great. Um, you, you, was it on purpose that you didn't talk, talk so much about the Ross line and the ley line from Paris to Chartres? Are they, are they connected? Is there something we need to know about this, uh, the Rose line? Uh, yes, actually, uh, those uh, ley lines were uh, activated uh, throughout the centuries uh, by the Qataris, by the Templars, uh, and also by some Masonic lodges that were all connected to the mysteries of Mary Magdalene. And uh, they were part of the greater project to reactivate planetary ley lines. Yes, okay, wonderful, thank you. Is it true that some Templars are descendants of the daughters of Mary Magdalene? Uh, yes, a few of them are. Those who are part of the Grail bloodline, they are. And uh, some members of Grail bloodline are Templars, some of them are in other mystery uh, groups, some of them are in white nobility families, and some of them are basically regular people not being involved in any of this. Wonderful. With, with completely regular names. With regular names, uh, no involvement in any of the spiritual movements, with no involvement with any of this, but with inner understanding and knowing about this. Right, and they're active also. They they have they have a, a practice, or the simple th fact that they exist is sufficient. Some of them have quite advanced practices. Some of them are in you know, various stages of awakening, but this is all part of a greater uh, undertaking, greater awakening that is happening. Wonderful! How great. Um, about the Templars' heritage, what was their aim in the first place? Um, there are various layers of Templars. There were the public group and there was the secret group. And the secret inner group was connected to the goddess mysteries. And the purpose of that secret group was to preserve the goddess mysteries. While the outer group was more involved with the creation of the new financial system and uh, was actually fighting with uh, negative uh, with black nobility for the domination of the planet, and they lost it. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, can you talk to us a little more about the Templars and the Sisterhood of the Rose connection? Um, yes, the inner group of Templars was connected with the Sisterhood of the Rose, uh, and actually, in certain instances, they were one of them, one and the same at a certain period of time, because um, there were secret uh, feminine Templar groups which were not public, which were not known, and were actually part of the system of the world. Okay. Um, I would love to ask more questions about this, but maybe if, if we have time at the end. Uh, when the Templars died, or when they disappeared, when they were attacked, what happened to their knowledge? Um, Templars had uh, systems of codes and uh, protocols in place, so if any of the Templars was in danger, there was a plan which was triggered to carry the most important documents and most important artifacts to other locations. So uh, there was like a communication tree established, and if anybody was in danger, uh, that was of importance. Uh, others took notice and took precautions. So most of the Templar knowledge did, was preserved, and most of the artifacts were preserved uh, in times of danger. So what happened to those who escaped the execution? Many of them traveled to other countries, some of them traveled to Scotland, some of them traveled to Portugal, some of them traveled uh, even across the ocean to what is now called the United States. Uh, they traveled to various locations where they just morphed into some other organizations like the Rosicrucians or uh, Freemasons uh, centuries later. Okay, and so are there people or organizations of Masons or Rosicrucians or other people? who currently carry true and pure Templar heritage? There are very few. Uh, most of them were corrupt throughout the centuries and infiltrated, especially by the Jesuits. So since the creation of the Jesuit, the Society of Jesus in the 17th century, uh, I would say since the 17th century, uh, the Jesuits were very active in infiltrating Rosicrucian groups. And from the 18th century, uh, they were very active in infiltrating the Masonic groups. So, they corrupted almost all of those organizations, not all of them. There are certain Templar organizations that have a pure lineage. There are actually some of the Templar organizations that I know that have unbroken 
succession since Mary Magdalene since for more than 2,000 years, but they are not public. They are not advertising themselves as such. I see, I see. So all the places or lodges that were corrupt, then they don't hold any of that heritage, the artifacts or the, or the teachings? They might have artifacts, they might have some of the teachings, they were confiscating books, they were confiscating uh, manuscripts, they were confiscating objects. Uh, I knew a few of the instances where things were simply stolen by those dark lodges and they are kept in the lodges and uh, are unretrievable. They are just kept under lock and key and nobody can see them. Uh, and they're also doing uh, magical occult uh, rituals with those objects. So, uh, unfortunately, this is what the situation is now. I see. Well, it's, it's good to know. It's good to know. Have the um, positive Templars and Cathars reincarnations actually, um, do they have a specific mission, although they have not all recovered their, all of their memories? Uh, yes, uh, actually, some of the people who were in Templar lodges and Cathar lodges have reincarnated uh, in this time, especially. As I said before, to reconnect, to reactivate their mission, to bring back the goddess and bring back the mysteries. And they are in various stages of reawakening and recovering of their memories. Unfortunately, most of them have been traumatized quite drastically in the last few centuries and are not in, most of them are not in very good shape. Mm, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, were, were they able to go beyond the veil after their death or programming their incarnations like members of Ordo Buchin uh, I would say it's very few advanced Templars and Qatars who, which have been trained with uh, very advanced occult training were able to penetrate through the veil, uh, go beyond the Archon Guardians to the higher astral plane and the mental plane where, where they were able to meet the masters, the sentient beings and uh, uh, beings of light, but most of them were just lost on the astral plane and then reincarnated again. Okay, okay, okay. So the third part of this um, point on history uh, would be about the Renaissance and the, and the dragon families. We are very curious about this, this white nobility in particular. And you said that the dragon society initiated the Renaissance in the 16th century and that the year 1504 had been important. We can see in the Trianon in Versailles, a certain Asian influence in the decoration and for example, an Asian cabinet. There's a rumor that at the time of the priestess Marie Antoinette, there was a Chinese pavilion. So were the dragons in contact with some families of white nobility in the following in the next centuries? And can we feel in Europe a new connection with them and the goddess Dumu? Okay, uh, yeah, this is quite a complex subject. Uh, mm. uh, dragon families initiated Renaissance already in the 15th century. There were some voyages uh, from China with ships. Uh, certain Chinese emissaries uh, came into Florence, uh, especially uh, brought documents, brought knowledge, brought understanding. And uh, this was the, actually the force behind the impulse of the Renaissance in the 15th and 16th centuries in Italy. And uh, after that, uh, I would say, especially in the 17th and early 18th centuries, the uh, Jesuits traveled to China and uh, exerted a lot of influence on the Chinese court and uh, also brought many of the ideas from China to Europe. Uh, but this has also triggered a positive response because some of the ideas from China took, uh, took place uh, and were growing, uh, especially in Paris in the 18th century, there was a strong movement uh, and strong fascination with the Chinese culture. And uh, Marie Antoinette was very fond of uh, Chinese porcelain. And also before her, uh, Madame de Pompadour was very fond of Chinese porcelain. And uh, there were many Asian cabinets in the courts of Europe in the 18th century. And uh, there were also, uh, occult lodges that were connected to, with dragon families, for example, the Asiatic brothers, which were very active in Germany in the late 18th century, they had some connection with the dragon families. Uh, Goddess Domu was not the main influence at that time in Europe, but uh, 
there was a lot of influence from the Blue Dragons, especially, and uh, Saint Germain had a connection with China, a strong connection with China already at that time, and he was well aware of the Taoist teachings and the teachings of the Blue Dragon. Mm, okay. Thank you very much. So the priestesses, they were, just to be clear, they were influenced um, um, by the Chinese culture and they had porcelain, but they also had some, perhaps some um, mysteries to, to exert themselves. There was a limited amount of mysteries present, especially to Saint Germain. He was talking a bit about this to certain people who were ready for it. And uh, there was, as I said before, a certain lodge called the Asiatic Brothers in Germany that um, had some contact with the Blue Dragon teachings. So those teachings were present, but were not widely known. They were only very limited circles uh, of highly advanced initiates. Okay, great. You also mentioned a link between the Vortex of Taiwan and the one of Paris. Can you please tell us a bit more about it? Uh, yes, it is actually a strong energetic connection, which was already established in the 18th century, as I said before, with, uh, between the courts of Europe and uh, the dragon family in Taiwan. The dragon family in Taiwan uh, was very active since the Ming dynasty in the 17th century and uh, had to go undercover partially in the 18th century, but was still very active and sent some emissaries to Paris and some of the German courts in the 18th century and was connected to Saint Germain also to a certain degree. Okay, okay, that's very clear, thank you. Um, so the, the second part of this uh, interview, we would like to focus on the age of Aquarius and the return of the goddess mysteries. You stated in a recent interview that the age of Aquarius transcends the Catholic programmation and that connection, if made in a positive way, can be very transformative. How will this religious programming be transcended exactly? Okay, um, the Catholic Church has misused and twisted the original teachings of uh, Jesus in a dramatic way. And people who are able to get a real energetic connection with Jesus or with Mary Magdalene will begin to discover the true teachings and this is how this religious programming can be transcended. This is one thing. And the other thing is by the understanding uh, mentally and spiritually of how this programming was created allows people to deprogram themselves. And this is why in my perspective study of history is important because you begin to understand the patterns, how programming was created and how uh, it can be undone. Hmm. So more specifically, how can we reconnect with the true teachings of Jesus and Mary Magdalene? Uh, this can be most effectively done through meditation and uh, for teachings of Jesus, if you read the Gospels in a way that is not with, not with prejudice, but with an open heart, you will discover kernels of truth because uh, although the Gospels have been altered throughout history and manipulated, there is some kernel of truth there. And if you are able to find it, you will be able to connect with his real energy. Um, I have a personal experience with the Bhagavad Gita, understanding the teachings of Jesus from a, another perspective. Can that help as well? Yes, of course. Uh, anything that connects you with the truth uh, can help. It, it can be in any scripture from any timeline, from any, uh, any country, from any culture. It can help. Okay, so use with discernment or yes. writings. Okay, perfect. On this topic also, could you tell us a bit more about the Operation Dreamland? Uh, Operation Dreamland, one part of the Operation Dreamland is the reactivation of the white nobility after uh, centuries of dormancy. And uh, key members of the uh, white nobility will at some point have key roles in the creation of the new Renaissance. Okay, great. Can you give more details on the precise role that the Sisterhood of the Rose will play during the event and what support will they have? Uh, Sisterhood of the Rose will have a very important role of anchoring the energies of the goddess throughout the event. And this will stabilize the planetary situation, which will be, I would say, extremely chaotic at that time. Many people will be in fear, uh, confusion, and they will not know what's going on there. 
belief systems will be shattered and uh, the circle of the rose will anchor soothing and calming energies of the goddess uh, and distribute them to humanity. Uh, certain members will be contacted very shortly after the event by the light forces and given further instructions and given uh, also some healing and support. Okay. Thank you. How will the temples and priestesses of the Rose be reactivated? Is there a specific plan for this aspect of the new golden age? There is a very specific plan about this, and uh, those temples will be reactivated, especially after the event when the funds will be released. A certain locations where there are vortex points will be chosen for temples to be built, and priestesses of the Rose will receive teachings directly from the light forces and training and understanding of how to anchor goddess energies more. And all this will be very active in the initial phase after the event. Okay, good. Since the activation by some priestesses in Notre Dame uh, for the return of sexual energy in women, can we see an effect globally? Uh, I would say there was an initial impulse which was very strong, uh, and it was felt throughout the later part of 2018 and the first half of 2019, but then the dark forces made a counter-offensive and suppressed the Kundalini very strongly back again, and also all the unresolved issues that women had, which were not processed and healed, uh, took over. So this uh, project was not absolutely successful. Okay, good to know. So now let's talk a little bit about astrology um, in 2021. This year, since uh, Uranus entered the game with a conjunction which occurred three times, first uh, squaring Saturn in Aquarius and then in Taurus, and Uranus was in Taurus. The first was in uh, February on the 17th, and we felt an intense energy at that moment, um, all sisterhoods. Some astrologers explain that this year is the year of the construction of the new world and the end of the old. Is this conjunction important regarding this statement? Uh, actually, it is not a conjunction, it is a square, which happens three times. Uh, Saturn squares Aquarius in February, then again in, in June, and then again uh, towards the end of the year. Yeah. Each of those uh, uh, squares is an opportunity uh, to empower people to resist tyranny and resist oppression. Uh, it's an impulse to say your truth, state your truth, uh, set some boundaries, put some boundaries, and... Uh, there needs to be a collective statement that we have enough, we do not consent to this. It's an act of free will that needs to happen. Uh, this energy is quite conflicting and uh, quite challenging, but the outcome can be more freedom if it's done correctly. Okay. Okay, we will support this then. Perfect. We felt also a beautiful feminine energy during the last full moon in uh, Virgo. Um, you posted a call to support an initiative to the silver um, to Silver that day, the day of this full moon. Can you um, give us more information? Uh, is a round two for Silver trigger operation in progress? Um, as you probably know, Silver is the metal of the moon and it carries the moon energy. And uh, Silver is the metal which brings goddess energy. And this is one of the occult reasons why the surface operation needs to have as much Silver in their hands as possible to bring balance to the financial system. And uh, yes, this is a round two of, for the silver trigger operation. Uh, the phase one was when I posted it on the blog in 2019, late in the year, and now it's phase two, which is more mainstream. And it's called uh, Silver Short Squeeze. And this is an ongoing project and this will expand in the future, hopefully. Yes, yes. Yes. In your last article, you drew attention to the removal of implants. Um, do you see any chance that some people will be able to completely remove them before the event? Um, and if yes, how can they be 100% sure that they succeeded? Uh, removal of implants is not so easy. I mean, it's possible. There might be some rare instances when somebody manages to completely remove the implants before the event. But practically speaking, I would say the complete implant removal will happen at the event and later. And those who will remove the implants 100%, they will know they succeed because they will have no more negativity inside. They will feel perfectly. 
So this is actually the state of immortality and ascension, which is quite an advanced state, which does not happen regularly on the planet yet. Okay, so they would surely feel it if that happened. Yes, yes of course. Okay. Um, so what would be a compelling objective for the, for the event? Okay, can you reformulate this question? Well, exactly. I was wondering about that question too. But our sisters would like to know if there's um, maybe a unified objective that we could share among us uh, in the sisterhoods and something that could help us trigger some energies. And um, how can we make sure that we are doing our, our best for one unified objective to help gather strength of women in sisterhoods? Uh, yeah, I would say that compelling objective would be to really manifest sisterhood. Sisterhood means supporting each other, not fighting with each other. Because there is far too much fighting within the light workers and also between the sisters in the sisterhood. I have noticed this a lot. And number one objective would be to create harmony and peace between each other. And this is number one. Okay. Number right. two would be to anchor as much uh, goddess energy as possible because the more of uh, goddess energy is anchored on the planet, easier the transition will be for all of us. Okay. Very clear. Is Contact Dish project still an ongoing project? Yes, of course. It is still an ongoing project. There are people who are joining uh, still and uh, it will be reactivated as soon as it is safe, as soon as the planet situation is safe enough the Pleiadians will begin contacting those people who are part of the project. Okay, wonderful. How does the um, Sisterhood of the Rose, um, how can it help the members, uh, men and women, obviously, to heal their wounds with their two polarities? And more generally, how can they actually help with this difficult situation on Earth before the victory of the light? Okay, uh, to heal those two polarities is much more difficult than I ever expected because people are not willing to face uh, their inner fears and uh, traumas usually. So it is not realistic to expect this to really advance uh, greatly before the event. Maybe in isolated cases, there might be individuals who will be able to do this, but on a massive scale, something like this needs much more support of the energies of the light, much more presence of the light forces and much better situation to be healed properly. Uh, understanding and guidance about this is present. I have given this through some of the articles and some of the workshops, but people are mostly not ready for this yet. They will be ready uh, at the event, after the event, and the Pleiadians will give a lot of assistance to those who are ready to heal them. Okay. Wonderful. So, is it important? Uh, is it primordial for the the Sisterhood of the Rose to work on their sexual energy, or do you think it's connected with this uh, the conflicts we see in our in our groups sometimes? Uh, actually, the, the problems with sexual energy are one of the main causes of many of the conflicts which are taking place. This is the hidden reason why many of the conflicts are taking place. And to heal those would be very beneficial, uh, to heal those as much as possible and to work on their sexual energy as much as possible would, would also be beneficial. Okay. Um, what can men do if they want to anchor goddess energy even more than some average women? The principle is the same. You can uh, anchor goddess energy regardless of if you are in a male or female body. The techniques, the principles, the protocols are the same. Okay, great. As for Yeros Gamos, um, can it be practiced without physical union or at, at a distance? It can be practiced uh, because uh, Yeros Gamos in involves physical plane, etheric plane, astral plane, mental plane, and you can practice it on a distance without a physical body to a great degree without the physical union, but the complete Yeros Gamos all, uh, only happens when there is physical body present. So to a degree, it can be practiced without physical union. Okay. Are there pairs on the surface of this planet at the moment who are able to practice Yahus Gamos in, a, in full or perfectly, let's say? Uh, there are some couples, not many, but there are couples who are doing this uh, practice uh, in a quite advanced way. What's their effect on the planetary situation? Their Kundalini energy uh, creates a strong uh, inflow of light and actually helps the planetary situation, especially uh, with the planetary energy grid dramatically. Great. 
How about the members of the resistance? Do they practice Yehos Gamos? Yes, yes, they do. Cool. Um, after the fifth um, uh, dimension, when we reunite, reunite with our twin flame, will the Yehos Gamos have any importance? Uh, Yehos Gamos has importance before our ascension. Uh, after uh, we meet our twin soul, Yehos Gamos can help both uh, parts, uh, both uh, twin souls accelerate their ascension process. And after they ascend, uh, their Yehos Gamos is not physical anymore. It happens on a very high Fifth and six are with the six and higher dimensional planes, and it's completely different. Okay, I see. Um, and by the way, is there um, any polarity after the sixth dimension? Um, are we still male and female? There is uh, polarity throughout the whole creation, throughout all dimensions, but it manifests in a much more refined and much more spiritual way uh, in six dimensions and higher. Okay. In the recent post, you referred to the code name Amiti. Is there anything more you can say about this and um, and goddess devotion? Uh, there is nothing I can say about MET publicly. It is the surface population is far from being ready uh, for this now, as it was not ready in the 18th century. It is not ready now. Okay. Do we know when it will be ready? Um, people in general uh, who are connected with goddess energy will be ready after the event, after they receive certain. Uh, instructions from the Pleiadians and other beings of light. Okay, wonderful. How fully is Divine Mother and Goddess Energy anchored on the planet compared to a few years ago? And how much further is there to go? Uh, it is anchored less than it was a few years ago because there was a collapse of part of the Goddess grid in, uh, in the second part of 2019 and throughout 2020. And there is much further to go. We are not very far. There needs to be much, much, much more goddess energy present on the planet. And one of the reasons why everything is so difficult now is there is far too little goddess energy anchored on the physical plane. And it is the purpose of the Sisterhood of the Rose groups throughout the planet and individuals to anchor as much goddess energy as possible in their own way. This is very important. In their own way, so in every way they see fit, through prayer, meditation, exercises, everything they know about. Anything they can do in their own way, that would be beneficial. Okay, great. How do we connect to our soul family? Um, you connect to your soul family through meditation, through inner knowing, and you also meet certain people uh, that are familiar to you, but not from this lifetime. You feel that you know them from before, you feel certain alignment certain harmony with their soul essence and this is how you can know that they are from your soul family. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And as a final word, could you give us a positive message for the public, please? Uh, yes, uh, we all know how life has been in the last year or so for most of us, but we are very close to the breakthrough. Uh, by very close, I don't mean today or tomorrow or next week, but uh, from the perspective of all our lifetimes, we are getting close to the finish line. And uh, the reason why things are as they are right now, why there is so much craziness, is because we are so close to the breakthrough and our forces know that we are so close to the breakthrough and they are freaking out. And they know much more than we do how close we are. They know much more than we do how close they are to losing everything. And this is why they're acting crazy. So if you know that, you can read the signs of the day in a different way, in different light. You can see their desperation, their mistakes. And uh, through that, you can be sure that we are very close, globally speaking, uh, from the perspective of all of our lifetimes, we are very close to the end. And after this it is over, we will be glad that we persisted. We will be glad that we fought our last battle. We will be glad that we did what we did with all the meditations, with all the activations, with all the projects. We will be very, very pleased that we have made those choices, that we have been one among the few people who have made that choice. It will be a very, very big inner reward to have that feeling that you are the one who contributed to the final victory. Yes, thank you very much for these encouragements. Thank you so much. Victoria of the